and welcome to the show to be named later where we're talking baseball kind of whenever i am your host chris gianta the other voice on the podcast is daniel curran how you doing daniel i'm doing good chris we are the messiahs that picked the world series in july that is just a fact it is our world and you are all just living in it yes before a pitch was even thrown in the 2020 season uh, Daniel Curran and Daniel Curran and, and I, we both knew exactly what was going to happen. That's right. Um, there were some, there were some twists and turns, uh, but ultimately, with the last two teams, we got it right. And uh, we also, exactly our, what we were talking about our uh, our friend also got it. Shout out to Robert Dickey, uh, as well as Jeff Passan. Jeff Passan got it pre-playoffs. We got it preseason. Oh, he no, well, he said in the interview that he thought he had it preseason. He, he, said, he said he knew he had the Dodgers, and he may have had the Rays as well. And I'm going to count it. I'm just going to say he had the Rays. I'm, I'm sure. All right. Well, shout, shout out to our, our last shout guest. Jeff Passan, regardless. Yeah, shout out to uh, yeah, our, yeah, our last guest, uh, Jeff Passan. That's right. And, uh, and his predictions. But, yeah, Rays-Dodgers, um, two most analytically – Driven teams, two deepest teams. Nerds and, win, uh, baby. And uh, and here we are. Yeah, uh, the nerds will always win. The nerds run baseball nowadays. Uh, if you're if you're mad about it, I'm sorry, but this is the way it is. Uh, this is the Rays with the 27th highest payroll in the league, but the most analytically driven team or the most analytically driven front office in the league. This is where they're at. They've been the best team in the American League virtually all season. I guess since the start of August on, you could say, because the Yankees did have them uh, in the earlier parts. But nonetheless, the Rays, they are the best team in the American League. We knew that going into the playoffs. We knew it going into the ALCS when they dismantled the Yankees. And we know it now that they are in the World Series. Yeah. And uh, yeah, this is this is the year for them to win. I mean, they, you know, especially this was a real factor when I when I predicted uh, what was going to happen this season. Yeah. Um, it didn't you know, go the way we thought it would. I, I, if we, if we would have been asked to guess like the starting lineup for them and like the, the clinching game of the ALCS, uh, I can't imagine we would a have Randy Rosarena on the 25 man roster, B have Randy Rosarena in the lineup or C have him hitting in the three hole. And yeah. That and that but is I, what happened. But what I'm saying is it was a fat, what was a factor heading into the season was uh there's no crowds and i think a lot of bigger market teams benefit from the crowds you know the yankees the dodgers Mm -hmm. dodgers ended up doing just fine without them um sort of i mean i feel like that kind of proves that it isn't really an excuse yeah and the Dodgers are a team that feeds off their crowds uh Mm -hmm. maybe the yankees a little more because that is such a hostile environment much more than anywhere else specifically to play in um, so I, I can understand that, but regardless, like the, I mean, usually two best teams in baseball. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. And, uh, yeah, Rays find themselves in, um, it's kind of been a, been a project for, uh, a few years, I guess. And they've just, they've happened to just find relievers and, uh, the Charlie Morton signing ended up being a lot bigger than. People yeah, probably suspected it would be going to be a free agent at the end of this year. Yeah, and uh, you know that that Glass now Meadows trade um, was kind of the cherry on top, and that hasn't even been completed yet because Shane Baz is still going to probably come up next year and then provide even more damage for the Rays and for the Pirates. <laughs> yeah, I was exactly sick. what a terrible deal by Pittsburgh. Like how much I was thinking about this a couple nights ago. How much uh, playoff share should Neil Huntington get? Um, well, for the race, how Neil much? Huntington what the, Neil Huntington is the Pirates GM who made that trade. And what was the question? How much like playoff share should he get? Um, Neil Huntington, he was the Pirates GM when he when they made that trade. Yes. Oh, <laughs> yeah. He should probably he should probably be getting about twenty five percent. Yeah. Of uh, what what the Rays general managers like like $300 that's like 25% of what they have right 
<laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. No, but... seriously. Like, that was – I mean, the Pirates had just gone on, I think, an 11-game win streak <laughs> to end the first half of the season. They still weren't even in the playoff picture, but they went on an 11-game win streak, and they decided that the time to buy was now. So they went out. They traded Austin Meadows, Shane Baz, and Tyler Glass now for Chris Archer, who was, like, a number three starter at best at that time. Yeah, I, I don't know what they were thinking. I think they – they thought, oh, these guys haven't developed yet. Maybe they, maybe they'll never develop. And uh, Chris Archer is the answer that we need to of, make a playoff run. A lot of Pirates fans have said that Glass and I would not have developed there anyway. Yeah, I mean, it's kind. Of, I might, I might have to agree with that. I, I might have to do, to do the same, but I mean, still, you could have gotten much more for him. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that's why I'm mad that the that the. Pirates have the number one overall pick. I mean, what are they going to do with Kumar Rocker? That's what I am worried about. Yes, like, do, are they going to be able to develop him? Like, are, like wh- who have they drafted in the first round in the past? Like Travis Swaggerty, he never really. I mean, I know he's like in the system still, but he hasn't come up yet. I don't know when his ETA is. That's the only guy I can think of off the top of my head. Uh, but I mean, this is the first time they're going to have the number one pick. I really love how the conversation has transitioned into what the Pirates are going to do with their draft pick. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, like, the last time the Pirates had a number one overall pick was Garrett Cole. Yeah, that's they, true. And they traded him for nothing. I mean, yeah. he, had a, he had a few good years, but uh, mm-hmm. in, in his last year before getting traded, he had an ERA over four, and then immediately is in the Cy Young conversation and becomes the highest paid pitcher in MLB history. Yeah, I mean, the Pirates, and then, yeah. Um, I, think that, I think that's a more – history more of a history with pitching like I, I key brian hayes i'll give credit to because he looks really good um he did a very good job o'neill cruz did you see that story from a couple months ago or this month or whatever it was he was the number 60 overall prospect in the league and he got a dui or something like that oh yeah that's, too, that's not great no not good not what you want so that's that and they have i mean yeah they have i don't know why but every pirates person is like there's something wrong. Like Jamison Tyon has to get Tommy John surgery twice. O'Neill Cruz, really highly touted prospect, and then gets a DUI. Felipe Vasquez, I don't even have to explain that one. That one just, it just writes itself. Could have gotten Gavin Lux for him. Yeah, it's uh, pretty, uh, pretty wild. But yeah, anyway, back to the Tampa Bay Rays. We should we should get right into the series that was, it was a series literally like we've never seen before. Yeah. Um, We've never seen, we've never seen a team come back from three Oh to tie it and then lose game seven. This is the first time in MLB history that this, that this happened. And uh, I mean, it wasn't when the Astros were losing, it wasn't like they were really getting uh, really, really dominated. Yeah, you want to go into the expected batting averages that you noticed for the, for the first few games? Yeah, so in game one, the Astros' uh, batting average for the day was 207. Their expected batting average was 319. Uh, in That's game a two, difference. Yeah, I, a over 100-point difference. Um, game two of the ALCS the Astros batting average for the day was 278 their expected batting average however was 357 another big difference in game three uh, another game they lost the Astros batting average was 206 for the day and their expected batting average was 265 so part of that is lack of luck but a part of that also is the Rays defense looking absolutely spectacular. I was literally just going to say, you can make of that whatever you want. You can say that the Rays got lucky. You can say that the Rays played fantastic defense. And that is true to some degrees. Um, I mean, Manny Margot making that catch where he like dove into the stands. Uh, Willie Adamas making a line drive leaping catch to his right and short. The du- all the double plays that were turned so nicely. Kevin Kiermeyer going all out. Like there was every single night the Rays just did something on defense that that made you leave your seat. Yeah, it was um yeah, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't necessarily well. say it was it was the Rays getting lucky and just having a having a guy there. You know, they had to they had to make their plays and they made it pretty much every time uh with ease. 
And then, yeah, and then the, you know, game four, you enter game four, uh, Tyler Glass now, who you have Tyler Glass now going, who um, has been pretty good. I, I have a, I have a problem with some of the hype this year, but I digress. He's still a very good pitcher, and he was going against. I, I don't even know who, who, who's pitching for the Astros game four. Uh, that would have been Granky. Yeah. Okay. He was going against Granky, who was not on the uh, best track. I think he, I think he had a rough game against uh, Oakland. And you're thinking Rays are probably going to sweep this the way this uh, series is going. Um, Astros win that game four to three. Then the next day it's bullpen versus bullpen. You figure the Astros should def or the uh, Rays should definitely take that one. It's a close game. Ends on a Carlos Correa homer, and then. Game six, uh, Blake Snell versus Framber Valdez. Uh, Framber Valdez looks very good in his start. Yes, he and, he looked, uh, looked great all postseason. Yeah, that's true. And uh, Blake Snell gets out kind of early. The bullpen is not as dominant as it usually is, and they lose that game seven to four, so it's tied for game seven. Yeah, so game seven comes along, and it is – Lance McCullers Jr. versus Charlie Morton. Charlie Morton's the number one guy on this team that you want on the mound for a game seven. He's done it time and time again. He was on the mound for you in the wild card game last year. He pitched game seven of the World Series and game seven of the ALCS in 2017 for those Astros. He's a proven big name guy, and he's exactly who you want on that mound come postseason time, come winner take all time. And he did his thing. Uh, I believe he went five and two thirds innings uh, with. No runs allowed, only 66 pitches. So a lot of people were confused when Kevin Cash took him out with two outs and guys on the corners. But ultimately, it did work out. Nick Anderson, uh, I think, went seven outs. Uh, yeah, he pitched two and a third. And then Pete Fairbanks closed it out, pitching two innings. And the Rays won the game four to two off of a home run from Randy Rosarena and then a home run and a sack fly from Mike Zidnino. Yeah, these were all. For the most part, it was for the most part it was a very some very close games, tight games, um, managers being tested for sure, and uh, Kevin Cash, Kevin Cash has has proven that he's the best manager yeah, in the game. He's the best manager in the game, and yeah. he definitely can be trusted in these uh, in these series. Yeah, I mean that's. You said it right there. Like, did Kevin Cash is a huge difference maker on this team. Uh, you know, obviously there is a lot of talent on this roster, but the way that it's built, it's more about how you use it and then, you know, what you have. And obviously, you know, most managers wouldn't put their closer out there with two outs in the fifth inning or in the sixth inning, you know, to get to get out of a gym and then some. And that's what Kevin Cash does. That's what he did in game five of the American League Division Series against the Yankees. He was the first guy in after Glasnow came out, which is, you know, it's very, very unorthodox. But like he has said, he has a whole stable of guys that can throw 95 plus. Yeah. You know, Kevin Cash also um, doing very well in the winner take all games. Um, I know last year he lost, he lost against uh, the Astros in a winner take all game, but uh, this year, but you can't even blame him for that. Like Glasnow yeah. didn't go out and perform. Yeah, game. And he, was, and he was quote unquote tipping his pitches. Yes, exactly. And mm -hmm. uh, game, yeah, game five of the ALDS this year. Game seven of the ALCS uh, this year. It he's looked very good. Pretty much flawless uh, decision making in these winner take all games so far for him. That's right. Yeah, I mean, the Rays aren't where they are without Kevin Cash. Like, I don't think Joe Madden – if Joe Madden was managing this team, this would be a whole different story. I think that's a fact. Yeah, you know, Joe Madden – Joe Madden was kind of – back when he was managing the Rays in, in, like, 2008, 2009, 2010, people would praise him for, like, being unorthodox. But now he just seems like a normal – everyday manager i think that was more exposed in 2016 like when he yeah. brought chapman out in game six and then it came back to bite him in game seven and obviously his team did bail him out but 
I think, yeah, I think he would have done that differently had he, if he had the opportunity to go back. Yeah, that's true. But yeah, Kevin Cash, uh, definitely, definitely using his guys um, accordingly. And, you know, when you, when you look at the series ahead, the world series, that's, that's a big factor, at least, at least for me, you know, Kevin Cash, you, you know, he knows how to utilize his, his players, especially his pitchers. Um, Dave Roberts, still a question mark, but Dave Roberts uh, won his series and didn't really make any fatal mistakes uh, in the series. Um, There were some decisions I might have, I might still disagree with, but it it ended up working out for him. Um, Do, do we want to get to the Dodgers Braves? Series, I think we uh, should now? we should we should address address the Astros. Yeah. So, I mean, where, where do we even start with this team? There were some very very uh, conflicting expectations for them. I I had them winning the division and losing in the division series, I believe, to uh, either the Rays or the Indians. Oh, I think it was the Indians. Um, you know, I really did not think that the not having the trash cans was going to play much of a factor. I thought that the offense would break anyway. And I mean, they still got to the playoffs. Of course they needed expanded playoffs to get there. They finished 29 and 31 under 500, the worst, like the worst winning percentage for a playoff team ever. Right. Um, yeah, I think so. It's like them and the Brewers is here. Yep. That makes sense. Um, and then, you know, you go into the postseason against the twins and say whatever you want about them, the Twins. They are a, a cursed franchise, and so are the Oakland A's, who are who the Astros beat this year. But everyone was writing off the Astros in two in two games. I didn't have them winning a game. You didn't have them winning the game. The most confident take I had going into the wild card series was that the Astros were not going to win a game. They had no business doing so, and they got all the way to Game Seven of the World Series or of the ALCS. I'm sorry, and. There were a lot of new faces that had to do so. First of all, you don't have Justin Verlander. That is a huge blow. You're probably never going to have him again. So that does affect future seasons going forward, especially with the fact that your division, for the most part, is going to be more developed next year. But that's a different story. Um, you have Framber Valdez, who, I mean, he dominated his way through that whole playoffs, so a 188 ERA in the postseason this year. That's really good for him. Christian Javier, guy who came out of the bullpen consistently, and got guys out and was very effective. They had so many guys in their bullpen, rookies, might I add, who like just like the Rays, they just was just one after another. They would all come out and they would all get outs. Like Brooks Rayleigh was a guy who they could uh they could look to. He had a uh he had a zero ERA in this series. Um and they had so many guys who just came out of that bullpen who no one had heard of to get outs. So the Astros did prove this year that they can be a successful franchise without knowing what pitch is coming. I know some people might disagree with that, but in the grand scheme of things, that's that's what it is. I mean, it, they still put up a valiant effort in these playoffs. Yeah, they did, and it was surprising to me because um, personally, my prediction for the season was they were going to be they were going to be the one seed uh, out of the American League. That's what I thought was going to happen. And they ended up being a reluctant six seed, uh, you know, not, not a traditional way to get into second place. And, uh, but they succeeded in the playoffs and, you know, they took on, they took on a team that probably wanted to, I guess, get revenge on them, the Oakland athletics, and they did very well against them. And I think I should point out there were two, two real big offensive contributors for the Astros in this postseason, and um, maybe not as much in the regular season, but Jose Altuve had a 1229 OPS uh, in the entire 2020 playoffs. And Carlos Correa had a 1221 OPS in the entire playoffs. So, I mean, they didn't have success in the regular season for whatever reason, you know, maybe, maybe it was, not having their resources, but uh, in the playoffs, they kind of turned it on. I think they had, they must, they must have had a different attitude in the playoffs than they did in the regular season. And, you know, they, what the Astros did 
with these playoffs is they couldn't really become an internet laughing stock like we predicted they would be. Um, yeah. We thought they were going to get swept in two games and the internet was going to have a field day with that. But um, that you can't really do that when you go when you take the Rays to seven games, you're one win away from going to the World Series. You can't really uh, you can't really pull out all the all the memes to uh, to mock you. So I guess that's what the Astros. That's that's kind of what the 2020 Astros did. Yeah, I mean, they they held up as much as they could. They obviously were not expected like I when people envisioned them losing in the playoffs or, or not making the playoffs, the elimination was something people fantasized about. Like it was going to be this big, just triumphant moment for the baseball world. And I feel like it just wasn't as big as everyone was hoping for because they got so far. And it's like, well, like, unless you're a raised Dodgers or, or Braves fan, it's like, well, they got farther than my team. So it's weird for me to, to do this. And even then, like, I, I told my friend when I was watching, like, it feels more like I'm happy about the Rays winning and I'm and less of I'm happy about the Astros losing. Yeah, it was uh it was definitely weird in that way. It was definitely uh yeah, it was definitely weird in that way. And they also kind of made history in a way, you know, they were the second team ever yeah. to tie a series after being down three oh. So like if they got swept if they ended up getting swept, that could it have been, been way more fun. That could have been a lot more fun for the internet, but they literally did what only one other team in MLB history has done uh, to get to a game seven. And uh, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess good on them. I guess you kind of have to, to tip your cap to that. Yeah, you do. Um, they, you know, they went down, they went down fighting for sure. And one game away from, getting to the world series uh you know you, you have to you have to have respect you have to have a little bit of respect for that even after everything they did uh you kind of have to tip your cap to that you have to tip your cap that's exactly right and you know some people will say otherwise and that's fine but they were one game away from the world series chris like a couple you know a couple missed pitches to randy rosarena and mike zanino here if that those don't happen, we are talking about a Dodgers Astros rematch. Yeah, exactly. And I cannot imagine what that would look like. That would be it would have been pretty fun. It would have been pretty good for good for baseball, but the Rays are the better team, and uh, I think we all knew that. We so did. that is why that's why they're in the position they are in. So and we want to get into Oh, there's one more thing I want to address with the Astros. Yep. There's a lot of question marks with this team going forward because you're going to lose George Springer. You're not going to have Justin Verlander next year, and you're going to lose him in free agency if he even decides to pitch again, which I hope he does. And I believe, is Brantley a free agent too? Uh, after this year, yeah. Yeah. So you're going to lose Michael Brantley, who is a, a big difference maker in that lineup, might I add. So I don't, you know, you're going to have to pull some more rookies out. Probably, I don't see them really going after anyone, especially with just sort of the state of, of that team from a PR perspective. I don't know how many big name players would want to play there, and I don't see them training anyone, trading anyone. So I really don't know what the Astros are going to look like next year and how they're going to be, especially because, like I mentioned earlier, the, the Mariners are going to be a better team, the Angels are going to be a better team, and the Oakland A's are still going to be there. So there's going to be a lot more competition for them within the division. So this really might be the end of their window. Yeah, it, it very well could be, especially if, um, especially if playoffs uh, stay their traditional ways and there's not that second place um, window. Cause in a traditional format, they would have, they would not have made the playoffs this year. Mm -hmm. So if they, Maybe if they have that second place cushion, if the if the expanded playoffs continue, maybe they can find their way into the playoffs for at least a couple more years. Um, but if not, might be a problem. But yeah, okay. that's kind of the Astros situation. We kind of we kind of addressed it after um, Justin Verlander announced he was getting Tommy John, 
Yeah. Yeah. And that was really the start. And obviously we didn't think that they'd go this deep into the playoffs back then. Yeah. And like, I think a real problem for them is free agents are not going to want to go to Houston after the debacle that happened there. And uh, I, I don't know if players are going to want to resign with them. Uh, I don't think it's a very good look to be associated with them, but maybe time will heal the wound. But I think for the next couple of years, they're not going to have a good time getting any like big free agents. So no, could be so. uh could be an issue. But yeah, let's get into Dodgers Braves. Yeah, this was we both had what Dodgers in five? Five. Yeah. Yeah. That definitely didn't happen. Um the Braves went up three to one in this series, which I mean they all say that's the most dangerous division or uh, series lead in sports. And it came back to bite Atlanta as they lost games four, five, or five, six, and seven. And the Dodgers, of course, are now going to their third World Series in the last four years. Yeah, the Dodgers. Dodgers are back. They're they're back in it, and you know we predicted it. A lot of people before the season probably predicted. I was going to say Dodgers. predicting the Dodgers in the World Series is not a flex. Like the, yeah, Braves, the, the Rays, sure, but the Dodgers. That anyone could have picked that. Yeah, Dodgers. It doesn't doesn't take much. But yeah, the Braves. Braves really really surprised me. Um, they were, you know, I guess, yeah. I had them splitting the first two. They ended up winning both of the first two. Uh, Max Fried looked very good in Game One, and uh, the Dodger Dodgers had what Bueller out for Game One. Yeah. Yeah, and. Uh, it was mostly the bullpen that kind of let loose. It was 1-1 until the ninth, and the Braves ended up uh, getting some home runs. The Austin Riley home run untied it. Yep. And then Ozzy Albies hits, hit one for insurance. Right to Mark Melanson. Yep. And they won that game 5-1. to one. Give the ball to Ian Anderson. Ian Anderson uh, does what he had been doing all postseason. Yeah, I mean, the only thing with him, uh, the walks were a concern. Five walks and four innings pitched in game two. Obviously, he could only go four innings because of that. He only allowed one hit. So, um, yeah, I mean, just commanding the strike zone is obviously something he needs to work on. And that was a, a bit of a problem for him in the regular season, too. But other than that, I mean, he was basically flawless this this whole year. Yeah, and then uh... – he didn't have to worry about much because the the offense was that good for the Braves uh, in this in game two, I believe. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to look at the box score, see when the when the runs were actually scored. Um, yeah, uh, they the they were up six. They were up six nothing after five. The fourth and the fifth inning. Yeah. They were able to get to Gonsolin in, in the in the fourth and eventually the fifth. And yeah, had a very big lead and the Dodgers almost came back. Uh this the the it was eight three heading into the ninth. Dodgers scored four runs and made it look kind of scary, but ultimately the Braves were up two games to none. Yeah, that was so I remember Ozzy Albies hit a home run in the ninth. That again went right to uh, the, went right to Mark Melanson. He caught it in the bullpen without even moving. Actually, he did move on this one, but you know, Twitter was just going crazy over that. And then, like ten minutes later, the Dodgers had the tying run on third because Bellinger had an RBI triple to make it eight seven. And then yeah. <laughs> AJ Pollock was the last out, but it was like a hard. It was a sharp ground ball to I think third. I want to. I'm going to check the expected batting average on that one. Because it was a sharp ground ball. I think it was like 360 or something. Yeah, that would make sense. Um, it was 340. 340. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so the Dodgers definitely did not go down easy. And they kind of led that, I guess, offensive momentum into the next game. Where they scored 15 runs in game three. All in the first three innings, might I add. Correct. He scored 11 runs in the first inning, which was a, a playoff record, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. For any inning, not just the first. Yeah, 
for also, any the inning. Second, the second straight year that the Braves allowed 10 plus runs in the first inning of a game in the playoffs. Yeah, pretty. The funniest part of that is it's the inning started with a Mookie Betts single with a batting with an expected batting average of 060. Oh wow. Yeah, it was like Mookie Betts beat it out, and that's why uh, against Kyle Wright. So then uh, Corey Seager hit a 105 mile an hour double. And then Justin Turner had a ground out, and then uh, oh by the way, all these were hard hit balls. Max Muncy with a ground out for the second out of the inning at 99 miles an hour. So two outs and two on. Uh, so this is looking pretty decent for Kyle Wright. And then Will Smith hit an RBI double at 109. Jack Peterson hit a home run at 106. Edwin Rios hit a home run at 106. Corey, Sing- Corey Seager had a single that was 80, only 86 miles an hour, but it had a 770 expected batting average. And then Max Muncy homered. Well, that was a grand slam, might I add. And uh, 107 miles an hour. Or no, I'm sorry, that wasn't the grand slam. Who hit the? Did Max Muncy hit the grand slam? Yeah, he did because the other guys walked. I was just looking at uh, I was looking at batted balls. I didn't consider yep. walk. Yeah, there were walks in there too. Um, so yeah, Max Muncy had a grand slam to hit it to make it 11 to nothing in the first inning. Yeah, I'll look at the. There were also four barrels by the Dodgers in that inning. Four barrels. Yeah, that's insane. Yep. Is you're a barrel. The average barrel rate is about seven percent, seven or eight percent. So getting four, four in one four inning is single inning. That's got to be a record or something. Yeah, it went single, double, ground out, ground out. So, yeah, second and third, two out. Double, walk, home run, home run, walk, walk, single, uh, hit batter, and uh, home run for the, for the grand slam to make it 11 to nothing. Yeah. Yeah, I was at, I was at Cheney for this. <laughs> nice. You missed a lot. I was in uh... – I was editing stuff for TV. I had it on my laptop, like right next to me. Yeah. The past two, yeah. For, yeah, for each of the past two 10 run first innings in the playoffs, I've just been somewhere else because, yeah, usually I'll miss like the first inning or two. I remember I missed that one too. Yeah, just doing stuff. The Cardinals won, yeah. Yeah, it's, you, you don't, you don't predict these things happening, but, I don't know, I guess. But, yeah, the Dodgers won that one. Uh, Julio Urias had a pretty good game. Um, yeah, he went five innings, one run, three hits, two walks, five strikeouts. Pretty good game for him. And then game four, game four, I thought Dodgers are definitely going to tie this series. You got Clayton Kershaw versus this absolute nobody. Nice. But uh, I was proven wrong. Yeah, you were. We were all proven wrong. Um, Bryce Wilson went out and shoved. I'll give him all the credit in the world. Six innings pitched, one hit, one run, one walk, and five strikeouts. A game score of 70. Really good. Uh, he is only 22 years old. Yeah. Uh, like Ian Anderson. He is a little bit older than Ian Anderson, though. But, um, yeah, if that's a guy – I mean, the Braves – people forget the Braves lost their ace this year. They should have had Mike Soroka as well. Um, that is true. So they're going to go into next year, assuming he's back, with a rotation of Mike Soroka, Max Fried, Ian Anderson, Kyle Wright, Bryce Wilson. Yeah, to go along with that lineup, that's a pretty dangerous team. Assuming they bring back Marcelo Zuna, which they should do. Yeah, you know, if you didn't, if they didn't resign Donaldson, they should resign Ozuna. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know. I guess. Uh, Donaldson had, Donaldson had had injury issues in the past. I don't believe Ozuna has. Uh, yeah, I, no, I don't think so either. I think he's, yeah, I think he's been a, a guy that plays a full season usually. But yeah, um, it was tied up 1 1 until the uh, bottom of the sixth. And then Clayton Kershaw just, he gave up an infield single to Acuna, which I, I guess is not his fault. Uh, and then he gave up a screamer of a double to Freddie Freeman, which I believe drove in uh, Ronald Acuna, if I am correct. Yeah. Yes, this that drove in Acuna. Yep. And then Marcelo Zuna uh, hit another double into the gap, hard hit. Uh, that made it three to one. And then Clayton Kershaw was out. The Ozuna ended up scoring, so four runs ended up being charged to Kershaw and 
Bruce Dark Gratterall did not exactly clean up the mess, but and uh, that was pretty much it for the Dodgers. It ended, ended up being a, a six-run inning for the Braves, and the Braves ended up winning that game ten to two, and they were up three to one, three to one on the Dodgers. No one really expected that. What could go wrong? Yeah, three to one. Yeah, what? Five. Uh, the Braves were up two to nothing early because they got RBIs in the first and second inning, respectively, off of Bueller. No, it wasn't Bueller. It was Dustin May. Yeah. Who was it now? It was Travis Darno hitting a sack fly and Christian Pache hitting an RBI single. Yep. And then the game would stay that way until Corey Seager. Remember this name going forward. Corey Seager homers in the fourth to make it two to one. And later on, skip to the bottom of the sixth here. Shane Green is on to face the top of the lineup up 2-1. Mookie Betts singles. Corey Seager flies out. And then Turner grounds into a fielder's choice after Betts had stolen second. So you now have, um, let's see. Oh, you have Betts. Wait, what happened to this fielder's choice? Did they get Betts? They got Betts out on the bases, didn't they? Yeah, they did. Uh, and Turner ended up moving to second. So then they bring in Will Smith. And as, I'm, as they bring in Will Smith, all I can think is you got to get Max Muncy on somehow here because then we could get the um, immaculate Will Smith versus Will Smith matchup. I don't care what happens, but we just we need that to, to be a thing. Muncy draws a walk on a really good at-bat, six-pitch at-bat, uh, was able to work the count. Uh, he got it to – didn't even swing the bat once. It was literally ball, 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 called strike, called strike, ball. So Will Smith – comes up against Will Smith, the, the catcher versus the left-handed relief pitcher. And what does Will Smith do against Will Smith? Well, Will Smith hits a three-run home run off of Will Smith to make it a 4-2 to Dodgers lead. And yes. I'd like to say that Will Smith had the advantage in that one. Uh, yeah, just like everyone predicted. Yeah, I, I knew Will Smith was going to come out of it. I knew he was going to come through when he did. Yep. Mm-hmm. That was a, that was the best Twitter moment of the of, this, of the playoffs so far. Uh, yeah. Everyone was going crazy over that <laughs> because, like, it's so perfect that it's also a name, uh, the the exact same name as like a big name celebrity who is also like there's memes about him too, so that that could be incorporated. Uh, but that was. That was a fun Twitter moment. And then Cody Bellinger flew out against the pitcher, Will Smith, to end the inning. Did you yeah. see um, Will Smith went to the dugout afterwards, the ca- the catcher, and said, like, hey, nice name, nerd. <laughs> that's, uh, that's funny. But might I add, Twitter moment, not Twitter moment, this is the turning point of the series, I would say. Yeah, this is, yes, literally this was also, like, the biggest breaking point for the Braves because the, obviously it was a, it was a two, one game. Atlanta was leading in an elimination game. You know, there was two outs in the inning. You have the favorable matchup because Muncie walked uh, and they brought months. They brought Will Smith in to face the lefty Muncie. He couldn't get him. And then you have the Will Smith versus Will Smith moment. Yeah. And it ends up, ends up giving the Dodgers uh, their, you know, giving the Dodgers the lead and, uh, gives them momentum um they score three more in the seventh uh Mookie Betts had an RBI single and then Corey Seager once again hits a home run making it seven to two and the Dodgers won seven to three and it was like all right we have a series we have Mm -hmm. a it's not going to end in five uh this is going to be a fun probably close next two games you got Bueller versus Freed and you got at the time we really didn't know who was pitching for the Dodgers, but you have Ian Anderson pitching for the Braves. Yeah. So then game six, uh, it was a weird game because the Dodgers scored all their runs in the first inning, uh, which normally you think that's a good thing, but like I don't know, this game just kind of seemed like a wash to me after the three runs in the third, even if it was the only runs that were given up. Like after that, it was Corey Seager homering, Justin Turner homering back to back. And then Bellinger hitting an RBI single. 
and I mean, Bueller did pretty well. He got through what six innings, which is the most he's done all postseason. So at that point, you you kind of just assumed like it's going to be over at that point. And then Acuna did uh hit an RBI double in the seventh to make it three one. But other than that, that was all the scoring. Yeah, Bueller. Um, the big thing for Bueller in uh, in Game Six, the big difference between what he did in Game Six versus what he did in Game One. Game One, he, he worked walked. Right game One, he walked five batters. Uh, game six, he walked zero batters. So didn't really run into that type trouble. Didn't throw, you know, he did throw some some stress pitches. Had some tough situations. Got out of them but control really helped him in uh, in game six. By the way, this is completely off topic, but what was the deal with the media during this whole series? Did you notice this, Chris? They asked, so you saw Walker Buehler's pants in game one, right? Yeah. They literally looked like yoga pants. And some reporter asked Walker Buehler after the game, like, what was the deal with that? And he was like, no, this is like not, this is not the time or place. Not, like, that's weird enough. But then they asked Max Freed the same question. Like yeah. what is what is Max Fried go a what is Max Fried going to know about that and b why do you think that Max Fried is going to answer that question even if he does this has nothing to do with him it has nothing to do with his team it has nothing to do with that his team won or that they're up in the series it has nothing to do with him like why would that question ever get answered and then uh, go, yeah. and then in game two um, I think it was Mark Melanson who got asked this a reporter was like talking to him about how the Dodgers were like rallying in the ninth, but you know, it was, they came up just short and the reporter asked the question where it was like, it was like, well, that was a really tough ninth inning, but you guys are up too well. Do you have any positive like takeaways from that? Yeah. I don't know. It like, I kind of understand how, like, I guess it might be a question for Mark Melanson because he gave up, four I runs but, Mark Melanson. but also like the question was phrased so really poor. weird yeah yeah it like was- I, under, I understand like like if I you know I guess I guess it's appropriate that you know we're in sports journalism so I guess we can crit- critique these things but like if you're gonna ask Mark M- Melanson if he's gonna like have a if he is gonna recover from this it's like you know, obviously, uh, that inning didn't go as planned. Luckily, you were able to get out of it. Uh, anything? Are you take? What are you taking away from this outing, or or something like that? It's kind of a neutral question, not really kind of going in uh, in hard on Mark Melanson. Yeah. Like, um. So I don't anyway, what, that was, that I don't was know what he was doing there. That was just such a weird, a reoccurring event, and then you have Game Seven. And this was a great game on all fronts. Ian Anderson, Dustin May. It was only Dustin May for one inning because Marcelo Zuna hit an RBI single in the first to make it one nothing. That would be the only damage of the inning. It looked like it was going to be a lot worse because Acuna walked, Freeman walked, Marcelo, Marcelo Zuna hit the single. Uh, so now you got second and third. Or no, I'm sorry, first and second with no outs and a run already in in the first inning. And then Darno grounds into a huge double play, and then Albie strikes out. So that ended up being that. And then to lead off the second, Dansby Swanson, it's a homer off of Tony Gonsolin, who had just entered the game. And then that was it for a while until late into, late into Anderson's outing, I guess, in the third inning only. He gets, um, he gets Betts and Seeger on four pitches combined. And, you know, you're thinking he's going to have a really, like, quick inning after getting to a jam net the last inning. And then Bellinger has a five – and then uh, Turner has an eight-pitch walk. Muncie has a four-pitch double. And then on the first pitch, Will Smith hits a two-run single. So that ended up being it for him. And that ended up being it for his outing because none of the inherited runners – or none of the future runners scored. So that ended Ian Anderson's postseason. He had an 096. ERA, 18 and two thirds innings pitched, two earned runs, and they were both right there. So it took him 18 and a third innings to even allow an earned run in the playoffs. So that was pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Austin Riley did hit a single the next inning to make it 3 2. 
And it kind of stayed like that for a while until in the bottom of the sixth. You know, we crit we critique Dave Roberts a lot, but pinch hitting Kike Hernandez for Jock Peterson in the sixth inning against AJ Minter, excellent move because he hits a home run to tie it. And then in the bottom of the seventh, Cody Ballinger comes up against Chris Martin and hits an absolute shot. Uh, I'm going to get this stat cast on this home run because it was hit very, very far. And like he had a perfect bat drop on it. Everything about it was just so perfect. And in fact, it was 107 miles an hour with a 33 degree launch angle, 400 foot home run with a 950 batting average. And yes, it was a barrel. Also, I'm just noticing in the eighth inning, Mookie Betts had a double on a ball that had an 040 batting average or expected batting average. I'm going to have to look at that again because that's kind of funny. Uh, a, a double on what? A double on a on a batted ball with an 040 expected batting average. <laughs> that is that's something. I'm going to have to rewatch that because I don't recall seeing that. But uh, I definitely was watching. So I'll have to look at that again because that's kind of funny. And then, yeah. And that was uh, it. Julio Urias throws uh, three perfect innings. Yeah, nine uh, up, nine down. Yeah, I guess if you could treat or critique Dave Roberts on anything is maybe maybe you have Julio Urias starting this game and, instead of uh, Dustin May and, and Tony Gonsolin, like kind of putting a combined effort. But I mean, I think it's perfect that they had him on hand for the end. Yeah, it, it did. If they – if May and – Gonsolin let the let like kind of let the uh, the air out a little more on the Braves. Maybe the Braves score like four four or five runs in the first two innings. Could have been a very bad look. It could have looked like I don't if uh, if you remember Game Seven of 2017 when uh, you Darvish struggled at first and then they had Kershaw in for four innings after after kind of the mess was created and you know Kershaw did well. But a lot of people were asking, like, why wasn't Kershaw starting anyway? So that could have been the situation with Urias, but luckily they had the lead, and Urias could uh, basically go right through the Braves lineup. He only gave up uh, two hard hit balls in under uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, nine, nine batted balls. Only two were hard hit. Um, so a very good. Very good uh, look for Julio Arias and I guess Dave Roberts. Yeah. Yeah, I'll give Dave Roberts credit because he did manage this game. Although it seemed questionable, it worked out. and it's, It looks like everything worked out for, for the Dodgers very well because of that decision-making. Yeah, and then you, I guess you get Arias for earlier in the, in the World Series. So, yeah, I guess it's going to be – are they going to have Kershaw go game two in the World Series? No, they're gonna have Kershaw go game one. Oh, they're ha- they're having him yep, game. Oh yeah, that's right because Bueller is probably not ready. Nope. Yeah, Glasnow nope. Kershaw game one. Yeah, Glasnow Kershaw. Uh, the Braves have announced that Snell is going game two, and I'm assuming that that means Morton's gonna go game three because there are off days. So that means, uh, do, I guess. Well, actually, we should let Wolf we'll save that. Let's talk about the Braves for a second because I want to do like a little obituary for all these teams that lose in the playoffs like we've done and this is a team that lost their race to a torn acl i believe it was what was it uh uh, torn achilles achilles it was a no doubt season ender as soon as it happened and he's going to be leading that rotation next year and you know what this team is only going to get better ian anderson this was his age 22 season and he came up he allowed one hit to the Yankees in his major league debut. He had a sub two ERA this year, and it took him 18 and a third innings pitch to give up a run in the postseason. So he's obviously been doing an incredible job, and he's only going to get better from there. Kyle Wright, he's only going to develop. Bryce Wilson, he's only going to develop. Tuki Tucson, he's probably going to develop as well. They have such a deep pitching staff in the minors, and they even have guys, I believe, that still have to come up. I mean, Christian Pache. You know, he did make his debut this year, but he's still going to have rookie qualifications next year. He's still in the running for rookie of the year. Um, They have Drew Waters, who's going to come up next year, probably. 
uh, who's an outfielder, to go along with Pache and Acuna. Um, Nick Marquez is, is a free agent, I believe, right? Yeah, he signed a one-year deal this year, I think. So this might, that might question whether he comes back or not because you're going to – have those three you're going to have Pache, Waters, and Acuna in the outfield next year and you're probably going to have Ozuna DHing if you bring him back which you should so that's obviously an interesting look and then you have you know the infield of Riley, Swanson, Albies, and Freeman and then you have Darno catching I believe right Darno's still yep. going to be catching. yeah when is Freddie Freeman a free agent by the way after 2021 Ooh. But I don't know how how old is he. He is. Uh, this was his age thirty season. He's thirty one. So I guess they got to get to work on extending him for probably yeah, a four like year deal. Four or five, yeah. Um, I mean, I don't really know what else to say about this team other than they're only going to get better from here. Yeah. What I'll, what I'll say about the Braves is they're kind of you know if you're a Braves fan you definitely want them you definitely wish that they won this year but they're kind of right where they need to be. Yeah. Uh, 2018, they they rose they early. early. 20, 2018, they kind of rose early and um, made a surprise entrance into the playoffs. And they lost to the Dodgers in the first round, which is kind of what you expected. No shame in that. Yeah. And then 2019, they made the playoffs kind of as expected. Uh, you won the division, which – a lot of people had them not winning the division, including me heading into 2019, but they even won the division, but they did not get by the Cardinals, which Cardinals were a good team last year, but they weren't, they weren't, you know, world beaters. You wanted to win that and face the Dodgers or face the, ultimately the Nationals in the LCS didn't get to do that. But this year they won two playoff series. They proved that they can win in the playoffs and they took the Dodgers to seven. You know, they, it's it stinks for them that they that they uh, blew a three one lead, but mm-hmm. this team, yeah, this team is only going to be getting better. They they have Mike Soroka next year. Um, they should extend Ozuna for sure, uh, like you said. Yeah. I guess get to work on extending Freeman. Um, you know, I guess Freeman yeah. should be a brave for life. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's correct. I believe he is he the only person on this team that was also on like the 2013 team that made the playoffs. Um, maybe maybe like a bullpen guy, but really, probably I don't even might, think it that. might be. But yeah, they're kind of where they need to be. And I think from 2021 on, um, for a few years, they should definitely be in the World Series conversation. And I think this year Next kind year. of Next year they are going solidified to be that. Picks. Maybe they, you know, maybe they go out and do something other than that. Maybe they get another big name. Who knows? Yeah. Who who really knows? Maybe they, yeah, maybe they took, take a bit maybe of they a take, dive. Maybe they, like, make a run at JT or Real Muto or something. Yeah, very possibly. But, yeah, I mean, no real shame in, in losing to this Dodgers team. Mm-hmm. Dodgers, This Dodgers team is built to Destroy. win a World Series uh, somewhat – they're built to win a World Series for sure. Yeah. Um, the Braves, I think, I think they just need, yeah, I think they need their their guys to come up, their guys to grow, and maybe a little uh, a little bit of bullpen depth, and they'll be somewhat there with the Dodgers. But right. we'll see. So I guess so, World Series preview. The World Series, the Fall Classic. Mm-hmm. We got the Tampa Bay Rays. We got the Los Angeles Dodgers. The two best teams in baseball. The only teams to win 40 games this year. And these are two. I tweeted this last night. The Rays, the Dodgers are basically the Rays with money. That's yep. what they are. That's a good like, way to say built, it. They're built very similarly. They're managed differently, but they're built under the same sort of circumstance. Or like, what's the word I'm looking for? They're both on all under the same ideologies, but yeah. the, the Dodgers obviously get the the privilege of spending money, which is not something that the Rays get to do. So I think it is more impressive for the Rays to get here, especially with the route that they had to take. Yeah, going to the Yankees and the Astros. Um, but 
I really don't know. I mean, I guess we're going to save our predictions for the end, but I honestly have no idea what I'm going to do. I think there's a lot of X factors on both sides, particularly the Rays offense. Um, 64% of the runs scored for the Rays in the ALCS were via the home run. So this is a team that obviously lives and dies off the long ball. And Randy Arozarena has sort of just stepped up and been that guy. He has seven home runs this postseason, which is one shy of the record that is held by uh, Bonds and one other. I really want to figure out who that is. Yeah, the question, I mean, we all knew this. We all knew this probably before the season. The question of everyone facing the Rays, uh, everyone in the league, how are you going to neutralize Randy Arozarena? We all knew this heading in, mm-hmm. especially, you know, this was a large factor in my preseason prediction. How do you neutralize Randy Arozarena? This is a guy who had an infield triple in the minors. This is a guy who rakes all day, all who rakes all night, day, year. Yes, this guy. He played a huge factor for the Cardinals last year. Yeah, it was a huge there, deal when he came know. over. How do you how do you neutralize Randy Arozarena? How do you how do you have Randy Arozarena not strike? That's the that's the question. And no one's been able to figure it out. I mean, people forget. We were talking about him in the regular season, about how good he was. Yeah, we, we just – yeah, when we were doing our – when we were breaking down the AL playoff p- picture, we were like, this Randy Arosa – Arizona – Randy Arizona. Ar- Randy Arizona guy, he looks pretty – his stats are pretty good right now. He's got an 1,800 OPS right now. Yeah. Like 20 at-bats. With like yeah. seven runs, and then he and then he hit another. I remember he hit another one as I was explaining how good he was. So I was like, I gotta update his OPS is actually two hundred points higher than I said it was five minutes ago. So, yeah, just randomly, uh, randomly very good, and yeah, he's been he's been nails. I mean, I guess there's there have been some other offensive factors. Uh, G Man Choi had a good Mike Zanino. Had, yeah. G-Man Choi and Mike I feel like every Mike Zanino hit has been like either the RBI single in game one or a home run. Yeah, his uh, his win probability added has to be uh, staggering. Very good, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, he hit 278 with a 911 OPS last series. He had five hits, two home runs, an RBI single, and uh, four RBIs. Yeah, um... And I think G-Man Choi had an OPS in the 900s or 1000s last nine. series. Yeah, it was it was very good. Yeah, he had some. Danny Margo started heating up too. Yeah, so like, you know, not big names, um, but you have some guys that are carrying some momentum, which is kind of what you need if you're the Rays. You need you just need guys to get hot. You know, you know you're not you know you're not going to have a more talented lineup than than the Dodgers, but you just need guys to be hot at the right time, which is exactly kind of what's happening. What they had, yeah. I mean, the, the Rays are a timely team. Like they just have guys step up every now and then, which at the right times. Like Austin Meadows, they're the the number one bat in their lineup heading into the season. Uh, went one for. What am I looking at here? Uh, two for twenty two in the series against the Astros with one walk. So obviously he was not a big help at the plate. And guess what? It doesn't matter because they still have so many other guys that are stepping up. And, and Austin Meadows could very well go off in the World Series. Any of these guys can. Anyone can do really well and anyone can do really bad on this team. There is no in-between. And it all just depends on the offense, really. That's kind of the big X factor for them. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I guess, I mean, I think it, I think kind of the, the situation is laid out there. You look at, if you just go, I think I think Trevor Bauer actually put out a good tweet about this series um, last night. He he stated what where the advantages are. I mean, I guess starting pitching, um, starting pitching. I think it's pretty close. I think it is too, but bullpen the Rays have it. Uh, bull, bullpen Rays have it, but I you know the Dodgers it's have, much have, have a deep want bullpen too. I mean, Nick Anderson in this series was a legitimate concern. He had an 8-6-1 ERA, uh, gave, up two run, gave up the two runs at game seven, gave up the walk-off to Correa. Uh, so that is definitely a concern. You need him to be better. You need him to be the guy that gave up only one run all regular season. Uh, that's big, of course. 
you need Pete Fairbanks to keep his control uh, up there because that's his, whenever he's had issues, it's been walk issues. You need Diego Castillo to be available as much as he can. And you know, one thing that the Rays are going to be having uh, that they have not had all postseason, which will benefit them more than anyone else, is off days. Like they, you know, I knew that that was going to be a factor of them getting here was because they're so deep and they have anyone available, you know, at the drop of a hat uh, with no off days. But now you're going to get, you know, you could get Nick Anderson in all seven games. Yeah, you could, you know, you could have if if you if you trust Glass now, you could have Glass now go games one five and maybe be in relief in a potential game seven. Yeah. Yeah, you could absolutely do that. Um, the the race can beat you in so many different ways. Like it's it's a different it's a different idea. It's a game, different story every single night. Like no two games that they've won this postseason have been the same at all. Yeah, the the thing with this series is the Rays. Yeah, they can beat you in different ways. It can be uh, timely offense. It can be a home run um, ball. It can be a bullpen game. It can be a dominant starter performance like we had in game seven. The Dodgers can beat you with many different players. It can be yes. Corey Seager. It can be Max Muncy. It can be Mookie Betts. It can be Bueller having a dominant start. It could be, maybe be Kershaw having a dominant start. There's so many different guys that can beat you, but the Rays, they have a versatility of, of ways they can beat you. Yeah, they do. Um, this is obviously their second career or second franchise World Series appearance. The other one, of course, was 2008. They will be going for their first World Series. And we could have three first-time World Series winners in the last four years if this goes the Rays' way. Yeah, which is something I like. I, I think uh, as cool. I've grown older, I've kind of like – like back in 2017, I, I, I was rooting for the Astros because I wanted to see them win their first one. I wanted year. like – and I wanted the – the Cubs obviously to break the curse and yeah the, the the Nationals that was really cool to see I mean I was betting on the Astros so I guess I had, I had my rooting interest on you put fourteen dollars on the Astros yeah I, I lost I lost a whole yeah 15, 14 15 dollars on uh on the Astros losing but yeah like it's always it's always nice to see new teams win the World Series um you know, I've always grown up and like watched, you know, the last few years we've watched the, the amount of teams that haven't won one just diminish where it was eight a few years ago and then it's seven and then it's six. And now we could be looking at five where it's the, what, the Rockies, the Mariners, the Brewers, the Padres, and the Rangers. And then yes. also, of course the Rays. Yeah. That, and I think, yeah, I think, I think the Rays winning would just, it, you know, I know it's cliche, but it would be like a 2020 thing. Just, it would just it would make a lot of sense for or Kershaw getting a ring would be a 2020 thing yeah if the Dodgers just followed through like that would be some I, I mean I guess uh the the Tampa Bay Lightning they were they won the cup this year they like for the past 10 years they have been losing in the playoffs constantly so I guess that would be I yeah. guess it would kind of make sense and the Los Angeles Lakers just won the NBA Finals, so there is there will be a city getting two championships within the course of a month. Yeah, so it would be would be interesting. So I guess, um, and any anything more we have to preview this this World Series? This, these are the two best teams in baseball, and this is what we deserve for the World Series. Yeah, and. I would be very surprised if it ended in less than six. This should be this should really, be a seven game series. So, so I have no idea what I'm gonna do. Yeah, okay. like this you should be a very very competitive series with some very. There should be some close games too. It should be mostly close games. Yeah. I I don't see any a, either I, team blowing the other team out. I have a prediction. All right. Do, do yeah do we predict is it time to predict Let's do it I'll so go. um i'm going kind of what with what i've always thought was going to happen gonna... i'm taking the tampa bay rays in seven games uh to win the world series i was going to do the same thing you're taking the rays i'm taking the rays in seven 
You take um, the Rays in seven. When I when we did our ALDS predictions, I said the Rays, you know, in the do or die game, they're gonna go all hands on deck. And the Rays in an all hands on deck game is a scary idea. If the Rays get it, to, if they were, if the Rays can get it to seven, I feel so confident in them. And this is not a knock on the Dodgers at all. This is just I feel really good about Tampa. I love their depth. I love everything about them. Just you know, the, the one thing that needs to happen is they need to have consistent offense and maybe rely a little less on the home run ball, but keep it keep it as a factor for sure. But I'm going to go Tampa in seven because of the idea of what they would do in an all hands on deck game. All right. That. And also, um, it's going to be in Texas, which is, you know, it's been known this season to, for, as a ballpark that keeps the ball in the yard. Uh, and I think the Rays being able to prevent the home run ball is huge. Like, I think that it has a much more of a positive effect than it does have a negative effect on them not being able to hit as many, if that makes sense. Yeah, I guess that, I guess that would make sense. You know, when you're face, especially when you're facing a guy as hot as Corey Seeker, I guess he'll, but you know, I guess the Dodgers have had some success, but I don't know. It, it could work out, could work out for the Rays, but I guess that leads to the conclusion of the episode. Uh, any, any more thoughts? I cannot wait to watch this series. Yeah, this is, uh, yeah. Uh, very excited about this series. I I I expect seven. Um, Daniel expects seven. I would guarantee at least six games. I and, hope. Uh, I really hope there's at least six. I mean, if how shocking how twenty twenty would it be if this was a sweep? If this was raising four, I mean that'd just be crazy. The the, the, the seven dollar raise taking down the two hundred fifty million dollar Dodgers. I mean that'd just be so twenty twenty. Oh my god, so twenty twenty. <laughs> But anyway, that leads to the conclusion of our episode. We hope you enjoyed this. Uh, if you want to follow us on social media, uh, follow me at Chris underscore Gianta on Twitter. Follow Daniel at Daniel underscore Curran on both Twitter and Instagram. And also follow the show Instagram at STBNL Podcast. We hope you enjoyed our uh, LCS uh, recap and World Series preview and we hope to see you next time when we might do we might record I don't know if we can record on Thursday but that might be an idea but maybe after a potential game 3 or 4 we should record I think honestly I'm cool with recording on Thursday I have time All right yeah we'll we'll probably do it yeah we'll probably record on Thursday put it out either Thursday afternoon or Friday morning yeah. and then uh and then after that it's going to be a straight world series recap Uh, so we hope to see you then and uh yeah see you next episode